And we are back. Both sides of the violence incorporated is a not-for-profit organization that's dedicated to crafting enduring solutions and resources that are aimed at addressing all forms of violence affecting individuals and highly vulnerable communities. Now, the organization is committed to supporting victims of perpetrators of gun violence. Here now and sharing more, we've got the CEO and founder of both sides of the Violence Incorporated, Shaniqua Coco Purvis. And uh, Shaniqua, thank you so much for being with us. Hey. Hey, and uh, we're glad, <laughs> glad to have you with us, sharing a little bit about your story and the work that you're actually doing. And you're quite passionate about it. When we talk about violence, I mean, obviously, um, you come from a place where violence was right at your doorstep. And so give us a little bit about how we got here. So December 28, 2002, my sister was murdered by a stray bullet that came in the window of her bedroom. It was three days after Christmas and I was the one who actually found her body. And um, that day is kind of like a blur, but yes, it was right at our doorstep. And when we talk about going through that experience, again, my condolences and, you know, we tell people that, uh, you know, going back on things, we're very thankful that you just are able to share with us because it's part of the journey of how you actually got here um, to really be a voice for both sides, um, really addressing the issue of violence, violence prevention. Uh, but then also, we'll talk about a little bit later on, you know, perpetrators as well. So as things continue to form, formulate, um, where'd you go from there? So in 2014, I decided to be a violence interrupter for SOS Best Eye, which is Save Our Streets, an anti-violence organization that's in Best Eye, Brooklyn, because that's where I'm from, born and raised. So I started doing that work, and I was, I was always um, giving back to my community, um, organizing events, giving away things, doing community events. And when I got into violence interruption, I was really, really digging deep into gangs and really um, assessing high-risk youth and what they were thinking and what made them commit crimes and what they really, really... So once I did that, I did that until 2019, and then I went to Man Up as a program manager in Best Eye, yet again, in Roosevelt Houses. Once I... Um, encountered a participant who actually was about to, you know, go to jail for murder, I was really talking to him and I was thinking about, you know, what would I say to the person who, you know, murdered my sister? And just so happened, you know, in God's intervention, he actually came home and he was looking to speak to someone in the family, mainly me or my mother, because I'm the old five girls. So, um... I decided to talk to him 18 years later um, after my sister's murder, and he taught me a lot in that three-hour conversation that perpetrators are victims, too. And I never looked at it like that. You know, we we, we walk on an eye for an eye. Right. You know, not realizing, you know, the, the, the repercussions of that. Yeah, when you, when you talk about having a conversation with the perpetrator and namely the perpetrator that murdered your sister um what what were you expecting were you expecting closure or were you expecting the opportunity to have an understanding i was expecting closure because you know we all grew up in the same neighborhood of tonkin's houses in brooklyn so i knew his family i used to be in his mother's house playing cards i knew his sister his sister grew up with my sister like we all knew each other he was much younger than us but you know, we knew of his existence. Like, you know, he was always like a little problem, what we might call a problem child in the, in the neighborhood. But it was pretty much for closure and to see if he was genuinely sorry. Right. But now and having that... Right. I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah, so he definitely was. And in his conversation, he remembered things about myself that I, you know didn't think he would. I was 17 and I used to take the kids out the neighborhood, you know, just to show them something else in Manhattan. I was a foot messenger. So I would be privy to a lot of free things in the city and I would take the kids out the project and take them to the city. And he was like, I wish I was one of those kids that you used to take out the city, take out to the city. And I was like, wow, you remember that? Like, you know, and once he was things about his childhood and all the trauma he went through, I felt 
sort of kind of accountable as a community leader, as a big sister, as a mom. Like, you know, I should, I didn't want to take the bad kids. I took the so-called good kids, which they really were. But, you know, I wasn't really trying to deal with the high risk. And maybe, you know, in that conversation, and I was thinking to take him out if I did do th- do things with him and showed him that he was important, that he mattered, maybe this would have never happened. So now you got your organization and you look at it from both sides, actually, the victim and the perpetrator. Exactly. Let's talk about the work that you're doing right now. So as of right now, I'm in the schools, I'm in the jails, I'm in the churches, I'm in the hospitals, I'm on my community board, I'm on a 79th Precinct Clergy Council, I'm, I'm going to be announced today as the community liaison for the 79th Precinct um, Community Council, and I'm on the Clergy Council, I am a minister, and I do a lot, a lot of work in our communities, in the community centers, and I have a girls group, I have a peer, um, peace group, peace circle group. And I'm just starting my siblings group. Mm -hmm. So it's siblings who lost a a sibling to gun violence or a sibling to incarceration. So we, like I said, looking at at it from both sides. It's often said that many times in inner city neighborhoods, we do have young people that only operate in a 20 by 20 block radius. They don't get the opportunity to have uh, much exposure, Uh, particularly in areas of poverty and then also in areas of inner cities. We see that to be a primary statistic. Talk to me about yourself, who created some exposure for some young people. How much does exposure make the difference uh, to somebody who may only be in that 20 by 20 block radius? So I was privy to be the associate director of a program called Project Restore Bad Star that was under our DA, um, Brooklyn DA, Eric. And we had gang members um, for a year, um, paid them $25 an hour to work and do internship. And we took them camping. And (laughs) it was a a, a wonderful slash crazy experience because to see people who's never been out of their circumference, out that 20 block, I don't even think it's 20 block. Most of them was five. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right, right. I mean, we're being generous, but yeah. Yeah, and when they went and picked up the chickens and saw the sheep and saw the uh, the goats, real good. He's like, I never saw a chicken before. I never saw a rooster before. Like, and these are grown men. So, but you know, they're in a gang, and there's nothing wrong with being in a gang. It's just what you do in a gang, you know. So, you know, we had them for a whole year, and unfortunately, we lost funding. But that was a great experience, and it taught them a lot like about life period. So a lot of them are now, some of them in Columbia University, some of them going to schools, most of them got their GEDs and high school diplomas and they most of them are employed. And we still service them in the community centers with workshops and teaching them how to facilitate workshops. Amazing work, congratulations there. Uh, I wanna also have an opportunity to talk to you about your LLC. You got a focusing on the realities of me called For Me and uh, what's that about? So for me is focusing on the realities of me with our young women, high risk young women. So I do believe that a lot of women went, they don't know themselves. Like they don't have too much. um, They don't, there's a lot of self care that they need to, 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 to learn. They need to know how to love themselves and focusing on the realities of me is, is dealing with that. So we have workshops with hygiene, um, um, financial literacy, um, um, pregnancy, um, health, high, like we have a whole bunch of workshops and programs to get to know themselves. So when I say focusing realities of me is focusing on your reality, whatever it is, and I'm gonna need you to you know focus on that. I need you to really focus on that. Because I believe that the power of knowing yourself is really (laughs) phenomenal. And a lot of these high risk young ladies don't know themselves and I just help them figure themselves out so that they could be better people. What was the turning point for you to say, listen, you know what? I really can make a difference in this community. I really can do something. Uh, I got this trauma I'm dealing with uh, and I got this pain I'm dealing with, but I do understand I can make a difference. When was that turning point for you? 
I guess the turning point for me was when I was raising other people's kids. <laughs> like, I wasn't just raising my kids. I was raising other people's kids, and the whole neighborhood would call me ma, auntie. Like, they really depend on me. I have seniors who depend on me. I have ch- our youth, our boys, our gang members, our police department, our hospitals, our, our schools that call me all the time, nonstop, needing help, and I'm always able to help them. So once I saw that, you know, my the kids that I raised was, you know, doing so well and going to college and getting great jobs and careers, I said, yo, I, I, I think that, you know, I should be able to help more people and yeah. get out my circumference too, because now I'm also people in the Bronx with my fiance. And so for yourself right now, what are the goals? I mean, you've got your organization going and you're impacting lives. Uh, what do you have coming up in the near future? Well, the ultimate goal is to not have gun violence at all, for families not to go through what my family went through and what the perpetrator um, of my sister's crime, his family went through. That's the ultimate goal. But right now, I'm just trying to get a base, like get some funding where I can have a building, um, um, have a place for them to come, a safe haven in Bed-Stuy. Grants, New York, Baltimore, Philly, like all the places, Chicago, all the places that they really, really need genuine help, get real resources in all of these communities. So I'm just looking for enough funding where I could be able to service people better. Because most of the time, the stuff that I'm doing, I do it from my heart. I don't get paid for most of the stuff I do. Right. And, and a safe haven is the thing that you're talking about the most, because I think if sometimes we could give people that, they have the opportunity to reach a place, go to a place, and get some, you know, counsel, or at the same time just be heard, makes all the difference in the world. Right. So my peace circles that I have every other week um, in conjunction with um, FEC, Bad Style, with ACS, that peace circle is so important because they come every other week just to sit talk, pray, eat, tell me whatever is going on in their mind and anything I can, you know, do, I'm going to do. I had a 12-year-old telling me that, you know, the cops was harassing him. And I know for a fact that, you know, the cops in my neighborhood, they are very, very about, they, they are about community. So I was able to mediate the situation with him and the police officers and have CCRB come in as a source so he could know his rights and when they finally um looked into the situation with him and his friends the situation went smooth because of that mediation so he was not he actually came home and he was able to be on probation and i have a, a contact with his probation officer so we could do what's best for him and not incarcerate him very interesting work there that you've been able to do because uh, given the heightened climate that we're in right now, being able to reach sometimes and touch people and have a you know intervention, if you will, doesn't always happen, but it seems as though you got the secret sauce for what's the secret sauce for you being able to reach these people right where they are? Being outside. Outside. <laughs> I'm outside. I'm consistent. That's another thing that our youth need, consistency. You can't just say you're going to do something and then next week you forget about them. Right. Next month you forget about them. No, you have to stay consistent, whether they're doing good, whether they're doing bad. Let them know that you're here still. Well, definitely needs to, it definitely needs to be underscored when you say we're outside because being outside means that you're visible and that you have connection. And being outside means that you're just not making decisions from behind a desk or, you know, for like we are right back here that you're really out there with boots exactly. on the ground. And that, and, that makes, and that makes a huge difference. So we're out of time, but I do want to thank you, uh, Shaniqua Coco Purvis, for sharing. She's the CEO of Both Sides of the Violence, and uh, she talks with the victims as well as perpetrators and does some great work. So thank you so much for uh, being with us.